<laughs> it is 105.5 WDHA here on the morning jolt. He's a long time friend of both the radio station and me personally. Dennis Dyken of the Smithereens, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Jim, and good morning to everyone out there in radio. <laughs> Saturday night, Carteret Pack, the Performing Arts Center, opening weekend, and the smithereens are there. I haven't been able to go down to the building yet, but the pictures I've seen, Dennis, are absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, it's a. we actually did, Jimmy and I stopped there uh, about a month ago, I guess, and it's, uh, I keep saying this, and when we were kids, not in our wildest dreams, Growing up in Carteret, could we have imagined of any facility uh, where live music would be taking place in in our hometown? You know, let alone something this sophisticated and uh, accommodating. And it used to be the old Ritz Theater, correct? Yeah, there was a, a movie theater there called the Ritz, which I actually never went to. I think it it was open for a while when we were kids, but there was the Ritz Theater. Um, and then in that same building, I believe, was uh, a, an accordion teacher where Jimmy studied accordion and maybe Mike when they were very young. And um, on that same block were a few like candy stores, one in particular called we called Little Kleins. It was a stationary magazine candy store. And they sold games and models and things like that. But we would go there. We would ride our bikes to... Um, to buy comic books and Mad Magazine and 16 Magazine and uh, school supplies. And it's just incredible to think that, again, when we were kids, if you told me when I was buying uh, Mad Magazine in 1966, <laughs> I would, first of all, be playing in a band that, uh, I mean, I knew I would be eventually, but that would, that would be uh, nationally known and that we'd be touring and we'd end up playing on this block. It's just it's crazy. Yeah, as Carter residents, you and Jimmy and Mike, it has to have a very, very special significance. And you've kind of alluded to that. Dennis Dyken from the Smithereens, our guest this morning here at 105.5 WDHA. Smithereens opening weekend at the Carter Red Pack this Saturday night. And one of the things that you're doing is now you've been on the road for a number of years now since Pat passed away. And it's hard to believe we're coming up on the fourth anniversary of that. But you've had Marshall Crenshaw or you've had Robin Wilson, they'll both be there on Saturday night, which I think will make the night that much more special, Dennis. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I, I don't think there's any way it couldn't be really with both of them there. They're both um, so good at what they do. They're both such great talents and they're both in their own realm. They, they, they bring the, each of them brings something different to the band uh, and it's, and it's uh, both are great, and it's going to be very cool to have the, the two of them there that night. It's just going to elevate it, I think, to a different level. When Marshall sings one of the songs as opposed to Robin, and I'll, I'll go with the song As We Used to Live In, how did the songs change from Pat to Marshall to Robin? You know, and again, that song, As We Used to Live In, while it may not be necessarily autobiographical, if you take it on that level, the house that you guys used to practice in. So when the four of you sang that, it had a certain significance. How does that change with Marshall and or Robin? Well, like I think like with any fine interpreter of songs, it just works. I mean, uh, Frank Sinatra, for example, uh, or even a guy like Del Shannon who sang Hank Williams songs, they, they, they were like actors in a way uh, they just got inside the lyric of a song and made it their own, you know? Uh, and that's what Marshall and Robin do it. Uh, you know, the three of us, Jim, Mike, and myself, it's, it still has the same emotion and meaning for us. Cause we think about our own homes, which happen to be in Carteret. <laughs> uh, uh, and we think about the house uh, on Front Street in Scotch Plains where we used to rehearse with Pat. Um, and I'm sure that like any other great interpreter, Marshall and Robin just read into it with their own experiences from what the lyrics suggest. You know, they think about either a physical house or 
particular or a particular uh, memory that can can um, be in, in, again interpreted by that lyric, you know. And the thing also with Marshall is he's such a tremendous guitar player. I don't know if people realize just how great a guitar player Marshall Crenshaw is. And that adds another dynamic to the band as well, Dennis. It does. And um, although Jimmy still takes the leads, there's a few songs Marshall will play lead on, but those are special occasions. Uh, the show is, you're right, Marshall is really a, a very formidable and, and cool guitar player, but um, he, he doesn't get to really showcase that as much because uh, there's Jimmy. Jimmy's the type of player where he just uh, he's a lead player, but he's like a chord lead player, kind of the way Pete Townsend was, mm -hmm. where he fills so much space and um, injects so much imagination and. Uh, and uh, finesse into what he does that uh, Marshall was there and doing his thing, but Jimmy is still pretty much the dude on stage with guitar. But you're right. Marshall is, um, bowls me over sometime, not only by his playing, but how many cool old songs he knows that soundcheck will just start. He'll start riffing on something and Hey, you guys know this one? Let's, let's see if we get, and we sometimes we'll take a, a tune and, uh, that from soundtrack and a cover song and incorporate it into our set or, or use it for an encore. Dennis Dyken of the Smithereens, my guest this morning here at 105.5 WDHA, Saturday night, uh, opening weekend of the Carteret Performing Arts Center in, of course, Carteret. Dennis, I know you've watched Get Back, the Beatles documentary. The question is, how many times have you watched it so far? Actually, I have a half hour. No, I have an hour left to go on the third one. Um, and uh, cause my wife and I, it's funny cause my wife said, you know what? Uh, we got the Disney deal. Just uh, my, my wife saw to it that we had Disney channel just to catch, get back. And she said, I, I, I'm doing this for you. I know you're really gonna want to see this and spend time with it. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. And if I, you know, I might not, I might not stay for the whole thing, but she did. She's, <laughs> she's glued to it. It's riveting. She's glued to it as much as I am. And we we're both uh, sharing it in the experience. Um, it is remarkable. Uh, all the, you know, of course, social media has just lit up with everybody's comments. There's a few detractors which mm -hmm. I don't agree with and don't really see their reasoning, but uh, there are very few. Everybody's really embracing this, and and uh, and I'm one of them. I. I it's not hyperbole. It's really a phenomenal document of that period in the Beatles' time and uh, and evolution or de-evolution, evolution, however you want to coin it. But uh, you know, apart from expanding on what was the Let It Be film of 1970, which I'm sure you saw when it came out, mm -hmm. and I, I remember I went to see it with David Fishback on Route One. It would. <laughs> Fox Theater. Second, second on the bill was a, a movie called Halls of Anger. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, Dave, if you hear that, I'm sure you remember, recall that. I still have the ticket stub. Anyway, uh, it, even though Get Back expands on that, I think one of the real thrills for Beatle fans, or even just uh, casual uh, viewers, is we get such a deep glimpse into the four guys' personalities. Uh, we've all scoured all the morsels of their history and, and people like us, Jim, you know, we, I know you're, you're like me in that regard where we just read everything we can, listen to all the bootlegs, all the anthology type material, but nothing I think prepared us for the deep dive. I don't like using that trite phrase, but, uh, into their their world it really gives us a, a deeper appreciation for their uh, personalities their senses of humor and uh, what they were all about it's uh, i can't say enough about it i probably said more than i should already there are so many moments that stand out for me one is watching paul mccartney literally pull the song get back out of thin air and yeah. you know the and the interaction between as you mentioned the four of them we had this idea that at that, by that point, 
Paul was writing a song, even though it was credited as Lennon McCartney. McC and Lennon was doing it again. It, you knew it was a John song. But at the same time, I don't think we understood just how much collaboration was still going on, whether it was a lyric change or a chord change or instrumentation. There was a lot more of that interpersonal dynamic going on than I think we had been led to believe prior to this documentary. I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it's also a kind of illuminating to see uh, even Mal Evans, their, their uh, road manager and, and equipment dude making suggestions yeah. uh, for a, a minor lyric change. But I think he said at one point to Paul, oh, you've already used that word. Why don't you do this? You know, and I think Ringo uh, chimes in. Apparently Ringo, uh, even going back to Eleanor Rigby, came up with the line, darning his socks in the night when nobody's there. So they've all pitched in, you know, and it's cool to see John uh, helping George uh, a few times and George helping Ringo with uh, Octopus's Garden. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of collaboration. And it's, I, I know I will be watching it numerous times. How many times have you watched it? So um, <laughs> I've watched the whole thing through once I've gotten, and then I've gone back to watch different segments. So mm -hmm. probably close to two times, the rooftop concert is mesmerizing. Especially yeah, I've tonight. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. The emotional release for mm -hmm. both them and us as fans. Um, there are moments in fact, the rooftop concert's a little different in that there's footage that we didn't see in the Let It Be film. So, mm. and I don't want to ruin it for you, but there is a moment in the opening song where John and Paul, an interaction, it, it happens. And you've been on stage, you know there's that moment where you just hit the pocket. And mm -hmm. it happens really early in, and it's, it's spine tingling. It really is. It's very cool. And, you know, there's, there were so many moments, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anybody that hasn't seen it yet, but Heather in the studio, mm -hmm. uh, Linda, while Yoko is there, is pretty funny, and Heather's performance is pretty wonderful. <laughs> uh, you know, there was other things like seeing um, moving images of Dick James, their publisher. Now, I've seen photographs. I don't know I've, that I've ever heard his speaking voice. Always been very curious about him. So that was. A whole other thing too. There was other moments like that, which I'm forgetting now. But yeah, it's um, it's really really cool. Well, I encourage our uh, audience to both check that out and check the Smithereens out Saturday night. It's opening weekend at the Carteret Pack with Marshall Crenshaw and Robin Wilson. And tickets and information online at Carteret Pack. P-A-C, CarteretPack.com. Dennis, a great show coming up this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us here on the WDHA Morning Jolt. Thank you, Jim. And, uh, you know, of course, I just want to add that uh, we are really dead chuffed about this show coming up. And, uh, and Pat's spirit will be alive on that stage with us for sure.